It's a new day, and CSIM is living the dream in paradise. He's just won the lottery, and by that I mean I've copied and pasted Rosebud into the console to the point where my control and V keys are so worn out that they're practically non-existent. He's procured a new house, a pool, hell, he's even able to afford plastic surgery and enough Botox to make all of the middle-aged suburban women turn green with envy. Okay, look, my girlfriend edited my sim and I had to get a little creative with the script. With his newfound wealth, he's also able to brush up on his science fiction-related lore. More specifically, his pronunciation and articulation of fictional planets from Star Wars. Dagobah. Dagobah? That's how you pronounce it? What the fuck, George? He even has a girlfriend, and don't worry, it's not attributed to his massive influx of cash. In fact, unlike the previous women, he didn't have to pay for this one. However, C Sim's most prized possession is none other than a painting he purchased, aptly titled The Tragic Clown. He forked up an exorbitant amount of money for this thing because allegedly this painting harbors an uncanny secret. According to legend, if you stare into the painting for a substantial period of time, the clown depicted in the portrait will seemingly emerge from the painting and pay the witness a visit. Now, I'm not exactly a superstitious individual, and C Sim shares that same sentiment. But you know, it doesn't hurt to satiate morbid curiosity. Sadly, it seems like the rumors are false, and C Sim has been swindled out of a good 100,000 not so hard earned simoleons. But hey, at least he tried. What the fuck? Thankfully, the aforementioned tragic clown is relatively amicable, albeit with some emotional baggage. And given that C Sim is just too cordial for his own good, it's gonna be a long day being this tragic clown's glorified therapist. This is what I'm gonna be talking about today. Easter eggs are secrets in games that range from unsettling to ominous to even blood curdling, minus the surprisingly lighthearted and somewhat humorous resolutions. Enjoy! When it comes to first-person shooters, there's not a single game more pivotal to the genre than 1993's Doom. It technically wasn't the first FPS game, but it did help popularize the genre on a widespread scale, and would subsequently inspire a slew of games that took a plethora of inspiration from it. Without Doom, the video game landscape just simply wouldn't be the same, and first-person shooters wouldn't be nearly as rampant in the market as they are today. Of course, with the critical and commercial success that Doom had garnered, a sequel would be commissioned roughly a year later, with 1994's Doom 2, a game that many people view it as a worthy successor to the already magnificent predecessor. Now, when brutally eviscerating your demonic opponents with chainsaws, double-barreled shotguns, and rocket launchers, you might be too caught up in the cathartic thrill of unleashing as much carnage as possible to notice some of the horrific scenery that encompasses you. We're talking pentagrams, mangled corpses, the fact that you're two hits away from becoming part of the scenery. Hey, wait, wait, wait a second, where are the fucking health packs? But none of these aspects can prepare you for what is easily the most disturbing yet morbidly humorous sight in the game. You see, after Doom's release, co-creator John Romero had almost immediately garnered a reputation as a legend in the realm of gaming. He was seemingly aware of this and ended up pulling an Alfred Hitchcock, as he would plaster his name on the covers of video games to help push more units. Unlike Hitchcock, however, he threatened you with a good time while doing so. So with his newfangled fame, the developers chose to place him in Doom 2 in the form of a fairly well-hidden easter egg. The final boss of Doom 2 sees you squaring off against the Icon of Sin, in a climactic battle that sees you utilizing the skills you've learned to their utmost potential. Normally, it's a moderately difficult boss fight, although some difficulties will leave you violently ripping your hair out until you look like 2008 Britney Spears, minus the umbrella. However, if you type in the cheat ID clip, you're able to phase straight through the Icon of Sin, and behind the devilish head lies another head, this time plunged directly onto a pike. And if the head looks familiar, you're either knowledgeable about developers in the video game industry, or John Romero is your sleep paralysis demon and you've just received horrific flashbacks. Yes, he's real, but I guarantee you, he wouldn't hurt a soul. I'm hosting therapy sessions later this week. Contact me if you're interested. After uncovering this grisly sight, you'll hear John Romero utter a seemingly incoherent phrase, but reversing the audio reveals that he actually says this. To win the game, you must kill me, John Romero. Now, the less bloodthirsty player might be a little reluctant to inflict even a modicum of pain towards the co-creator of Doom, but the grand majority of players will follow suit and proceed to fire an entire arsenal of bullets at the decapitated head. Funnily enough, you can actually complete the level by doing this, and essentially breeze through the entire boss fight, even if you technically had to use cheats to accomplish it. It's such a downright uncanny and disturbing easter egg, but it's one that also serves as a grim yet outlandish tribute to one of gaming's most influential figures.
The Sly Cooper series is one of many PlayStation franchises that, sadly, hasn't seen the light of day for quite a prolonged period of time. And it's a damn shame, too, because the series had such a unique blend of platforming, action, and stealth that it really helped set it apart from its contemporaries. The, as of right now, latest entry is 2013's Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, a game that was viewed as another solid addition to the franchise, but largely divided some of the hardcore fans of the series. Honestly, I love Thieves in Time. It has its flaws, sure, but the stylish, cel-shaded visuals, humorous story, and and genuinely great boss battles are some of the many reasons why I come back to replay this game on a fairly consistent basis. And that's not even mentioning the numerous playable Cooper ancestors that help freshen up the gameplay with numerous abilities and traits. Can Sly cause fire to erupt from his hands or use his cane as a makeshift revolver? I don't fucking think so. A major selling point of the Sly Cooper series, at least in my opinion, has to be the numerous villains that you'll come across. They range in personality, narrative importance, and motivation. Take for example Miss Decibel, a failed musician that would eventually resort to convincing other to do her dirty work. She's the Sly Cooper universe's closest parallel to Charles Manson. Except she didn't convince someone to murder Sharon Tate, and he didn't have a trumpet lodged up his nose. Cocaine, however, was a possibility. Perhaps the series' most daunting antagonist is none other than Clockwork, and contrary to popular belief, he's not a clock and he sure as hell doesn't work either. He can't even get the spelling right. Clockwork is a hulking mechanical owl who holds such bitter disdain towards the Cooper clan that he willingly transformed himself into a half-owl, half-machine hybrid just so that he could eliminate and outlive them, which is the most extreme form of jealousy that I've ever witnessed. His obsession with the Cooper clan would inevitably culminate in his downfall, as his entire robotic frame would be destroyed by Sly Cooper. But is he really dead? Although he doesn't make an appearance in Sly 3, he does make somewhat of an appearance in Thieves in Time, in the form of an unsettling series of appearances. Throughout specific points in Thieves in Time, if you get a good look at your surroundings, you might just spot clockwork perched up in numerous areas, watching you from above. It's just downright unnerving to know that throughout the entire of Thieves in Time, Clockwork is somehow still alive and well, possibly planning his next cold-blooded attack on the Cooper clan. However, with Sony's reluctance to release a new Sly Cooper game, Clockwork might just end up achieving his one goal, outliving the Cooper bloodline. Saints Row the Third was the pivotal moment in which the series took a complete 180, ditching the relatively earnest tone of the first and second game and embracing a deliberately absurd and downright ludicrous flavor of storytelling. With over-the-top action scenes, perpetual raunchy humor, you can see where I get my inspiration from, and even a shotgun that causes the unfortunate target to be devoured by a shark, maybe it's the same one the series jumped over. Saints Row the Third almost came off as a parody of the very series that inspired it, Grand Theft Auto. Now, I personally love Saints Row the Third. In fact, I would argue that the absurd nature of the game is what ultimately helped set it apart from its contemporaries. And for all the hardcore Saints Row fans that are watching this video, firstly, I'm sorry that you were given such a dumpster fire for a reboot, and secondly, I also enjoy the first two games, so keep that in mind before you attempt to crucify me for my sinful opinion. Plus, I'd prefer the guillotine anyway. So when a game as absurdly goofy as Saints Row the Third has a moment that's even remotely sinister, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, Saints Row the Third has one of those moments in the form of one of gaming's most perplexing and simultaneously disturbing Easter eggs. Head on over to this area on the map on Erebus Island, and you'll find a suspiciously boarded up house. Okay, look, there are a couple of other boarded up houses, but this one is special. It's a little unsettling, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Upon further inspection, however, you'll hear some downright blood-curdling noises emanating from the house. Now, there are numerous theories as to why this occurs, but the most consistent theory that I've seen is that the poor citizen in the house is being terrorized by zombies. Yes, zombies, stay with me here. Towards the end of Saints Row the Third, a zombie outbreak of cataclysmic proportions encumbers the livelihood of Steelport after a chemical explosion causes the residents of Erebus Island to transform into bloodthirsty and ravenous zombies. Isn't it crazy that a Saints Row game with zombies as a pivotal plot point feels more like a Saints Row game than the reboot? This of course means that zombies are going to roam the area of Erebus Island far more consistently than other areas of the map. The developers even went so far as to aptly rename the area Zombie Island in... Horde mode. What's interesting is that this same house contains the exact same audio clip in Saints Row 4, despite its external overhaul. Regardless, there is one thing that I can draw from this event. This guy is determined to fight for his life. Two games and an entire property renovation, and he's still hanging in there. Give this guy a medal. And maybe a break from the zombies, man. Jesus. Yeah.
Rockstar Games is no stranger to eerie easter eggs and secrets, and their magnum opus Red Dead Redemption 2 is no exception. Get used to hearing about Red Dead Redemption 2 a lot on this channel. It's one of my favorite games of all time, and if you disagree, that's fine, you're entitled to your opinion. But start getting personal with it, and don't be surprised when you get a knock on the door followed by what we in the South like to call a redneck vasectomy. Red Dead Redemption 2 was easily Rockstar's most meticulously detailed game to date, so it's no surprise that you'll find a profusion of easter eggs in the game's immaculate rendition of the Wild West. You have everything from ghost trains to serial killers to a vampire, even a ghost woman that I covered in quite extensive detail in a previous video of mine. Go check it out if you're interested, but just be warned of my microphone quality and frequent sex jokes that I still overutilize in my scripts. It's like trying to milk a cow only to realize it's a bull, but it's not a bull either. It's your next door neighbor. By far the most unnerving easter egg in the game, for me at least, comes in the form of the strange man's shack in Lemoyne. In the first Red Dead Redemption, John stumbles across a rather peculiar man with an impeccable sense of timing and fashion. Just look at that mustache. In the branching side quest, aptly titled I Know You. In it, John converses with the aforementioned mysterious figure known only as the strange man. How fitting. The strange man reveals that he is quite knowledgeable about who John Marston is, as well as the actions he's performed throughout the game's campaign. The side quest culminates with John attempting to shoot the man after being understandably perturbed by the man's vast knowledge of him. However, the bullets are ineffective and the abnormal man walks off completely unscathed as John attempts to comprehend what just happened. Many have theorized that the strange man is the Red Dead universe's equivalent of the Grim Reaper or sometimes Satan himself, with certain nuances and obscure details in his mannerisms being notable indicators. What are you doing here? My accounts. I'm an accountant. Is that so? In a way. Now, after Red Dead Redemption's release, many were hoping that the strange man's origins would be further explored in the sequel. And while it's not entirely proven as to who or what he is, there are a handful of secrets and easter eggs that shed a little bit of light as to who he could potentially be. In Red Dead Redemption 2, after making it to the epilogue in which you take control of John Marston as opposed to Arthur Morgan, you can visit the southwestern portion of the map without being constantly barraged by bullets, bounty hunters, and the strong arm of the law. Visiting the general store in Armadillo will lead to John taking particular interest in a painting proudly displayed by the store owner, Herbert Moon, with an oddly familiar face drawn on it. But wait, the homages to the strange man don't end there. Head on over to Bayou Noir in Le Moyne, no, not Bayou NWA, you gotta wait about 80 years and make a trip westward, and you'll uncover this seemingly innocuous shack in the middle of the swamp. Head inside, however, and you'll eventually start contemplating your decision. Much like John's decision to wear long sleeves in such sweat-inducing weather. Ever heard of Swamp Ass Man? Because inside is a grim, foreboding, and downright terrifying sight. You'll find a series of cryptic paintings and messages sprawled along the interior, with one of the messages in particular sharing the same name as the side mission featuring the strange man in the first game. You'll even find a letter, linking the strange man to both Herbert Moon and the devastating cholera outbreak that plagues Armadillo. However, the most terrifying aspect of this shack is a blink and you'll miss it cameo by the strange man himself spontaneously materializing in the mirror behind the player. After turning around, however, he mysteriously vanishes, and glancing back into the mirror reveals that he's nowhere to be seen. Yep, okay, I'm done. That's enough ominous shack investigating for one day. I'm gonna go get some sturgeon. Look at you! When it comes to great gaming sequels, I'm genuinely baffled that Watch Dogs 2 doesn't come into conversation all too often. Watch Dogs was, in my opinion, a pretty damn good game when it released all the way back in 2014. Sure, its ambitions were a bit too lofty when it was first announced, which ultimately led to the game disappointing the fans who were eagerly awaiting its release, but as someone who didn't have that pre-release hype and excitement, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Sure, it has flaws, even the most ardent of supporters wouldn't argue against that, but for what it was, I found it to be a pretty great experience from beginning to end. Watch Dogs 2 was deliberately made to acknowledge and improve upon the original game's flaws in every conceivable fashion, swapping the dark and gloomy rain-soaked streets of Chicago for a more vibrant and colorful San Francisco, while also making the gameplay far more open to experimentation. It's a genuinely fantastic sequel and an equally impressive standalone game in its own right, and many avid fans of the series now often view Watch Dogs 2 as the best game in the franchise. One of the biggest improvements to Watch Dogs 2 was the far more expressive and lively San Francisco setting, packed to the brim with details and secrets to uncover. 
discover. One of the game's coolest secrets is also one of its most starkly harrowing, and believe it or not, wasn't discovered until months after the game's release. After heading to a boxcar located on this spot on the map, you'll uncover a rather sinister blood-red painting of a being known as the Shuffler, and enabling hacker vision reveals a shape in the exact same spot. Snap a picture and you'll hear some puzzling and eerily uncanny audio. I tried everything. Flush them out with water. I, I, I stuck Q-tips as far in as I could. Some might find this audio clip disturbing, but I think she's just a bit paranoid. Perhaps she's not all too familiar with how the ear canal functions. Maybe it's crazy, but I need to find out what is in my head. Ma'am, it's called earwax. What ensues is a convoluted and rather lengthy series of steps, which sees you deciphering a code and taking a picture in front of a particular wall at a fairly specific period of time. After doing this, you're able to interact with the wall, and poor Marcus is put through a roller coaster of mental turmoil. Either that, or he's experiencing the hallucinogenic side effects of ketamine for the first time. Take your bets. After experiencing this, Marcus will snap back into reality, whoops, the ghost gravity, and beside him will be a neatly stacked pile of clothes, showing that the shuffler is just as omnipotent as he is gentlemanly. As disturbing as the easter egg is, it also comes with a rather entertaining reward, the suitably named Shuffler outfit. Now at first glance, there's nothing too out of the ordinary with this outfit. It looks pretty neat, but there's gotta be something else it provides given the gauntlet that I've just put myself through in order to get it. Well, if you're in the midst of a firefight and you choose to utilize a melee attack against your enemy, you're able to do what I can only describe as something that Darth Vader would have done if he didn't originate from a PG-rated trilogy of films. Yeah, he's, uh, he's not coming back from that, is he? For the final entry, I'm taking a look at Psychonauts, one of the most wildly creative and flat-out underrated platformers that I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. When Psychonauts released, it was a critical darling, but sadly went under the radar when it came to commercial sales. It puts you in the shoes of Raz, a boy with psychic abilities who winds up in a summer camp designed to train those very powers. He also has an immense fear of water, which is actively personified by an aquatic hand that attempts to drag him under the water if he gets too close. Why do I bring this up? Well, this game failed commercially in Waterworld under performed at the box office. My third eye is sensing a bit of a correlation here. However, water is far from the most petrifying thing in this game. Not according to Raz, of course, but we're not factoring in his opinion. Psychonauts actually contains some pretty dark and macabre lore, which I was not expecting for a game that lets you ask for hints by pulling out a piece of bacon and letting an elderly man quite literally talk your ear off. Early on in the game, Raz meets Mia Vodello, the bouncy and upbeat Psychonaut that teaches students the power of levitation. Behind her cheerful and party-centric demeanor, however, lies a dark and gut-wrenching skeleton in the closet. The level at Mia's dance party, which takes place inside the mind of Mia herself, has a very convivial and welcoming atmosphere, and is easily one of the most vibrant and eye-catching levels in the entire game. Whenever you traverse through the level normally, all seems relatively innocuous, but you might wonder why Mia has such a comically tranquil and cordial attitude even in the most dire of situations. Something seems a little bit off. Well, if you stray off the beaten path a bit and head towards this door, Mia will become notably rattled and insist that you come back to the party. However, if you refuse her request and continue to venture into the deep recesses of her mind, you'll uncover a shocking and downright terrifying discovery. After hopping into the toy box in the corner of the room, you'll discover a plethora of creatures known as nightmares that, with their raspy and ghostly voices, perpetually ask why they weren't saved from their demise, alongside some other unsettling remarks. It's disturbing enough as is, but exploring the room outside of the toy box reveals Mia's depressing backstory. She once worked at an orphanage and took care of the children that lived there. One day, after returning from a grocery store run, she returned to the grisly sight of the orphanage inexplicably engulfed in flames. And despite her best efforts, she was unable to salvage any of the children. It's a painful memory that lingers in the back of her mind, and uncovering this backstory gives her quite a bit of added depth as a character. Now, with this in mind, hopefully Raz gains an important series of lessons here. Maybe he'll gain a greater sense of empathy, or a more complex understanding of the human psyche. And maybe, just maybe, he'll think twice before blindly pummeling someone or something into oblivion. My bad. See you in hell. See, Sim? Get the water balloons. We're gonna make this asshole piss himself.
Hey, so real quick, I wanted to say thank you so much for tuning into the video. The video that I released roughly a week ago has now hit over 300,000 views, holy shit. And I just gotta say thank you guys so much for making that possible. As someone who is attempting to make YouTube into a prospective career, I mean, this is just, this is amazing for me. So thank you so much for all of that. I will be attempting to upload videos on a far more consistent basis. And now that I'm up to almost 10,000 subscribers, holy hell, again, thank you. I'm going to be trying to put much more time into my YouTube channel than before. So once again, thank you guys so much for your support. Hope you guys have had a great Easter, a great April Fool's Day, anything else in between. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Take care.